Hey people, just Siobhan here quickly jumping in at the start of the show to remind you that we have a new sponsor and that is the Animal Public's book series which is part of the University of Sydney Press. So the wise people at the University of Sydney have decided to have an animal studies focused series. It's called Animal Publics. It has fantastic series editors in Fiona Proben Rapsi and Melissa Boyd. It is the hot place to publish your animal studies work and also a good place to go and look if you want to stock up on animal studies publications for your institution. So check out Animal Publics, part of the University of Sydney Press. This is another iRaw podcast. We podcast to make the world a better place for animals. Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey people, welcome to Knowing Animals. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is brought to you by the wonderful people at ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. And in fact, our guest is on the committee of ASA. She's one of those wonderful people. ASA works very hard to support animal studies scholars to bring you good news of conferences, exhibitions, funding opportunities, call for papers, new publications. So ASA really is a one-stop shop for all things animal studies related. If you're not a member of ASA, I strongly encourage you to think about joining. Membership is a very, very reasonably priced. So that's ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Well, this episode of Knowing Animals is coming to you from Christchurch, New Zealand, where I'm attending the 2019 ASA conference called Decolonizing Animals. And as I said, I'm joined by one of the members of the ASA committee, although she perhaps won't be at the time that we... Oh, she will be, yes, ongoing ASA. She's a secretary, which is actually a position I once held. So you know already that she must be a person of superior quality. So this week I'm joined by Dr. Claire Archerline. Claire is Senior Lecturer in English at the University of Sunshine Coast. And today we're going to discuss Claire's article with Animal, Exceeding the Absent Reference Through (laughs) Materiality. I've really found this paper very confusing, but I'm going to understand it more in a moment. And it appeared in the journal Hecate. Is that how they pronounce it? I think it's Hecate. Hecate in 2016. Welcome to the podcast, Claire. Thanks, Javon. Okay, Claire, as I said to you off mic and I'm prepared to absolutely say it again in front of all the listeners, I'm going to need help with this paper. Why did you write it? What inspired it? So are you asking about what um, comes from this paper particularly or from my movement to um, critical animal studies? I'm more interested about this paper. What was it that you thought, right, I've got to sit down and write this? Yeah, well, I, I empathise with your confusion. <laughs> I think that <laughs> a lot of times, we, you know, sometimes talk about literature, you know, the, 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 the language can be um, confusing. The things that we're doing is trying to actually do a deeper reading of work that's there. So in this paper, it really began with my, my being intrigued by uh, a book I saw listed in the Animal um, newsletter that comes around for all ASA members. And I saw this book, um, a short collection of stories by um, McGee. Um, I've got a, um, it's a while since I've written it, so I'm forgetting the the authors, and I want to get that right. Carol Guess and Kelly McGee. Um, and the, yeah, the collection was called With Animal. And I could see from the blurb that it was about this idea of humans, mainly, who give birth to animal babies. And I thought this is um, – um, I'm – but my work is again and again fascinated by literature that rejects realism. And then we've talked a lot at this conference about the problems of rationality and realism, the ways in which it can't really respond to the crisis that we face in the Anthropocene and the crisis that we face in terms of our human and animal relations. So I thought this is, is, so, is something that is – challenging realism but also is something that is speculatively possible because of 
the scientific experiments that are being conducted um, right now uh, where, where this is a very real possibility, it's, it's happening. Um, so I ordered the book and I read it and I just thought, I wonder, I wonder what this is doing. And at the same time as I sort of finished reading that book, we saw the call for papers for the, l uh, the last um, Australasian Normal Studies uh, Conference, which had a theme of um, intersections and, and intersectionality. Uh, so I was interested in how this book responded to questions of various forms of oppression, um, particularly uh, feminism um, and heteronormativity as that relates to speciesism. Wonderful. Now, am I right in thinking that one of the ways in which you read this book was via reference to Carol Adams' work? Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, so, I think <laughs> I love Carol Adams' work and I love the way it sheds light on literature. I think one of the concerning questions that really dominates literary animal studies is how do we find stories that will show animals in and for themselves? Um, it's a question that um, Helen Tiffin often um, asks and a as does as Philip Armstrong in his work. So it's thinking about how do we see animals not just as symbols, not just as allegories, how do we m and, and how do we make them visible because the quite conservative history of literary studies sees animals entirely in that space of symbology or not at all. And what Adams does is show us that that's not something that's just happening in literature, that the absent referent, the idea that we, we in our metaphors um, of our everyday, our qu quotidian existence, our, our food and, and, and so on, we, we make animals invisible. Um, and we have these signifiers that hide the real trauma, fragmentation, objectification and, and violence that's inflicted on the animal body um, with, with our language. So I was interested in whether this book with Animal was able to show, um, to make those, those absent references visible in some way through the idea of, of imagining human beings with animal babies. And what did you find? Well, I, I think it did. I, I feel that, yes, of course, you, you can't ignore the way in which this work functions as allegory. Um, certainly, it's drawing attention to a whole range of issues in terms of um, different issues that intersect with maternity and ideas of normativity. So questions around um, the expectation of an able-bodied baby, the expectation of heteronormative parents, the kind of restrictions that those place on the maternal experience, um, the ways in which the maternal experience is seen to be kind of neutral, this sort of either nurturing body, but certainly a, a body that is sexually neutral as well. So it's certainly speaking to all those things because it is a book that's full of sensuality and that sensuality is not just that deep love and intimacy that occurs between the mothers and the babies, um, but also um, between the mothers and their partners. Um, there's a lot of... Um, non-clarity around genders in the nar narrators. There's a lot of um, queering of that uh, experience. So we, we, we have to understand that these animal babies are an allegory at one level. But I think at another level, um, they are trying to speak um, to the reality of animals as both kin and as something, uh, as beings that have a wordless and important existence with and beyond us. Um, yeah. So, in perhaps, perhaps you can answer this either way, either through your reading or your deeper reading with reference to, say, the work of Carol Adams, for example. What does this tell you um, more profoundly about the human 
um, relationship with non-human animals or the non-human condition? I think it tells us that um, animals have these rich lives and particularly intimate relationships that exist beyond our normative objection um, to them and objectification of them. So this particular um, story I think is interesting, I think, because of the way in which the women often refuse to participate in a patriarchal culture. So the, the stories, I mean, the stories are a little bit tongue-in-cheek. They're, they're, they're a thought experiment at one level, but they are, they are speculative. They imagine a kind of speculative future, but also a kind of fairy tale future where it's completely ordinary and within the realm of existence for human mothers to give, give birth to or have an, in another way um, have uh, animal children. But they, um, the children are not just there as, as metaphors. They, they, they have complex lives. They um, insist on their own right to live, their own right to intimacy, their own right to um, not be in the service of human stories. So do you recommend the book to readers? I, yeah, I really do. I really enjoyed um, this collection. And I think I really enjoyed also the way in which it kind of is a work of excess. Um, it's excessive in terms of its exceeding of the, the paradigms of, of realism. It's excessive in terms of the kinds of narration that it uses because it is a collection of short stories. I think there's about 27 short stories. And some are first person, some are second person. Um, which is quite unusual to, to use that second person address to, to you, to the directly to the reader or to a, another participant in the story. Um, and some are om, omniscient and they're excessive in terms of their blending of sometimes some speculative sci-fi genre, as I said, the, the fairy tale. Um, yeah, I, I think they are interesting too and they're interesting in terms of their composition. So they were composed... Um, not as a kind of anthology where one story um, is by McGee and another story by Guess. They actually were begun by one author and then they sent it to the other author and then... So it became, even in, in its process of crafting, a way of opening up beyond our understandings of, of an, an individually authored um, text. So, yeah, I, I think they're, they're really fascinating stories. So, if people are listening to this episode and they perhaps are someone who really enjoys reading literature, how do you recommend people get into the practice of reading literature in a way that's profoundly attentive to the non-human? I think that um, it's important to think about the animal that, as I said before, not as a symbol, not as, um, as Philip Armstrong has said, as a, as a screen to project um, human ideas upon. We get so used when we teach close reading at university or if even in, in our ways of reading in book clubs and a whole range of other settings, um, we get close used to reading in terms of what does this mean? I think, you know, the triple rainbow across the sky. What does it mean? What does it mean? Um, and we need to search for animals in stories and think, how are they there in and for themselves? And also to resist um, and, and critique any representations of animals which are not just there as symbols but also there as which replicate um, forms of violence against animals and to not to take those for, for granted. So I think we need to be attentive to things like food in, in narrative and what, what foods are being eaten and why. I think we need to think about what narrative experiments might work. Um, for example, anthropo, um, anthropomorphism, how we use things like sentiment and affection between human and non-humans or between non-humans. 
um, to help us better understand the place of animals and to allow those animals to have some kind of agency because in literature we can actually imagine ourselves into the mind of um, an animal, even though that's always going to be an imaginative project. Um, I think that's what makes it so exciting. But we also have to be aware that the stories that we do tell are really important and that the stories that we have told have had a profound impact on the ways in which real animals are, are treated in, in the material world. Mm, interesting. Well, Claire, I ask everyone who comes on the podcast to answer five quick questions. Are you ready for your five quick questions? I think so. <laughs> Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever read? I'm finding this a really hard question to answer and I'm wondering if I can cheat <laughs> and say... <laughs> Most people do. ...a couple. Um, I think, obviously, you know, I, I, my passion for literature began as a child. So I, I think it probably was something like um, Anastasia's Black Beauty, something like that would have been a sense where I, I felt um, moved by um, the experiences of animals, although, you know, as an adult reader I have issues with the kind of singular focus of that story and it's focused just really on the on the bearing rain and, and so on rather than more complex ideas of of the animal. Um, I think as an, a person who was then an adolescent, um, I think Gandhi's Experiments of Truth I read in my late teens and that led me to vegetarianism and then on to, to veganism. So I think for me as an individual that was a kind of unusual route into thinking about that in that way. Then in my scholarship, because my, my PhD scholarship many, many years ago began looking at First Nations narratives, I would say probably my early readings of things like um, David Yanaipon's Myths and Legends of the Aborigines was, um, which is a David Yanaipon's often seen as, as a very early writer in English, really helped me better understand the com complex other ways of thinking about animals and their relationships to human beings. So that's a bit of an um, unusual answer. but That's wonderful. I like unusual answers. Thank you. Can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yeah, well, this, that's, this is um, hard too because I feel like I always had a kind of um, advocacy position for animals um, through my own personal politics and my, my um, limited role in, in environmental activism and so on. But I, probab I probably started it th through my, um, my... The first piece, I'd say, which was published would have been a chapter in a book that came out of my PhD in, um, I think, 2006. And the book was... Uh, cross-cultural analysis of the writings of Thomas King, who's a Cherokee writer, and Colin John Johnson, who's a black Australian writer. And in that I wrote a chapter on coyote and crow and the role of, of trickster narratives. So I think that probably was a place in which I was really considering animals and stories and the kinds of important different epistemologies we need to bring to bear on, on those relationships. So I think that's probably the first, although at the time I don't think I would have necessarily called it critical animal studies or even knew what that term was. Mm. Mm, yes, I think I think quite a few other people might have had a similar experience to that. Yeah, just dis discovered that they were doing something that others were also doing. So if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Uh, I, w I would say um, probably Josephine Donovan, um, who is who has written a lot about um, in, in literary animal studies. Um, she's Her beautiful book, um, An Aesthetics of, of, of Care, uh, has been really significant on, on my work, but of course Carol Adams as well. Um, and I, I want to say also John Simons, who um, I think just writes so accessibly and so beautifully and really engages me in questions to do with therianthropy and anthropomorphism. Um, so, yeah, I think probably... Yeah, wonderful. I mean, I'm familiar with John's work and I agree, he writes very beautifully. 
So what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Yeah, I mean, the question of what, what can academics do is a, is a bit of a different question to what other people can do. And, I, and so I am kind of limiting it to thinking about it from that academic perspective. So I, um, I think the be most important thing for me is to collaborate with other disciplines to ensure that the significance of critical animal studies ways of looking at things are being engaged with with other disciplines because that, speaking from my limited perspective of literary, uh, the lit lit literature discipline and literary animal studies, it's really important about the stories we tell, it's really important the stories we talk about, but it's really important that we find ways to connect with other disciplines so that we can have practical applications of our work and a way of looking at things. So I finished in um, the end of 2017 a, a, a quite a large project on the Fraser Island dingo, which I led, but I had to collaborate with scientists and um, sociologists and geographers. And that was really an amazing experience to actually see the ways in which those conversations bear fruit and can create impacts um, beyond the kind of beyond academia. Wonderful. Well, if you had the power to change one thing about the human non human animal relationship, what would it be? <sighs> it's always magical one time with this question, isn't it, Siobhan? I, I don't know. I, if there was a way, a simple way of kind of working and putting a lot of energy into getting over mastery, this concept of mastery, I mean, I think about this in terms of the um, work that I've, I've, I've participated in and, and, and collaborated in in um, the management of, uh, in, in researching the, the management of dangerous animals and, and so on. If, if a lot more focus was on people rather than animals, if we were not trying to master um, environments, um, a lot of other stuff would fall from that um, where we wouldn't see that animals are property, spectacle, service providers, um, that we weren't trying to m see them as a wild that is managed and controlled. I guess getting past mastery, I'm not really being very articulate at this point, but um, I think that's probably the, the main thing I'd like to see change. Yeah, no, I d absolutely. I hear what you're saying and I understand why it's important. Well, Claire, what are you working on next? A lot of my focus is now, I mean, I, I loved working on with animals. It's a, a work coming out of um, the States. But I'm, I am really focusing a lot more on Australian literature, particularly Australian literature at the millennium, sort of from 1990s uh, across into the beginning of um, the 21st century. So um, I've got a few publications coming out uh, of that work and I would like to do a, a, a bigger project um, on that. I, yeah, I suppose that's that's where I'm at right Beautiful. now. So how can people find out more about your work? Uh, well, they can go to my uh, web page for my institution, which if they Google Claire Archer Lean, I don't think there's anyone with the last name Archer hyphen Lean. So if you Google Claire Archer Lean University of the Sunshine Coast or just USC, then you'll see that straight away. And um, you can see my research bank there for publications or I'm really happy for people to email me. I love to hear from people. Um, so that's just Karcher, C-A-R-C-H-E-R, which is the first part of my um, last name, uh, at usc.edu. Hang on, dot at usc.edu.au. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, there you go. Email away, listeners. Well, Claire, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to the listeners for joining us for Knowing Animals, a podcast where we speak to animal studies scholars about a piece of their work. Now you can also contact us. Perhaps don't necessarily email right away unless you've got something very important to say. But you can find us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at so underscore s. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. Finally, don't forget to leave a review on iTunes. Reviews make it easier for other people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com.